Good morning and welcome to our message this Sunday morning. We are continuing our series in John's Gospel and today we're in John's Gospel chapter 13 verses 31 to 38. John chapter 13 verses 31 to 38. Please turn with me in your Bibles and we'll read that together. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified with him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, So I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, these verses before us form a kind of introduction to the great chapters 14, 15, 16, 17 of John's Gospel. There are three chapters of the teachings of Jesus, that's 14, 15, 16, and then there is the great prayer chapter, uh, John chapter 17. By this time, Judas had already left to carry out his evil mission, and Jesus then began to teach his disciples, which now we see carries on all the way to the end of John chapter 17, a very lengthy uh, session of teaching. We'll start off with verses 31 and 32. Let's read them again. When he was gone, that's Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. I must tell you, these are two deep verses. Uh, They will always reward a serious study and meditation, but I must tell you there are things contained here that I think our human minds struggle to understand. In them, Jesus is revealing the overwhelming purpose of his mission during his life here on earth. And as shocking as it may sound, that overwhelming purpose was not our salvation. It was God's glory. Everything Jesus did, said, thought, moved, was all calculated to be for the Father's infinite glory. Now, much of the truth of this, we will find a mystery to our human mind. God's glory was very important to Jesus. We found it earlier, one chapter back, in John chapter 12 and verse 28, we found this, Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So there's a lot in our Bibles, and you can follow that theme through. You'd need some good commentaries. The glory of God as revealed in the 
teaching, the life and the ministry of Jesus. Now, I hope you don't mind. To help us with this verse, I've consulted our old friend, J.C. Ryle, and as usual, he hits the nail smack on the head. We're talking about the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. So let me just read these two paragraphs for you. The crucifixion brought glory to the Father. It glorified his wisdom, faithfulness, holiness, and love. It showed him wise in providing a plan whereby he could be just, and yet the justifier of the ungodly. It showed him to be faithful in keeping his promise that a seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head. It showed him holy in requiring his law's demands to be satisfied by our great substitute. It showed him loving in providing such a mediator, such a redeemer, and such a friend for sinful man as his co-eternal son. The crucifixion brought glory to the Son. It glorified his compassion, his patience, his power. It showed him most compassionate in dying for us, suffering in our stead, allowing himself to be counted sin and a curse for us, and buying our redemption with the price of his own blood. It showed him to be most patient in not dying the common death of most men, but in willingly submitting to such pains and unknown agonies as no mind can conceive, when with a word he could have summoned his father's angels and been set free. It showed him to be most powerful in bearing the weight of all the transgressions of the world and vanquishing Satan and despoiling him of his prey. This is the glory of the Father and the Son in the crucifixion of Jesus. Despite appearances to the, common, to the contrary, the crucifixion of Jesus, as we have seen, was a moment of immense glory. It fulfilled all that had gone before and would result in a great sweeping tide of multitudes who are saved to love and worship God and ultimately to inhabit and enjoy the new heavens and the new earth. There is much in this which we don't have time to investigate today. Moving on to verse 33. John chapter 13 and verse 33. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you. Where I am going, you cannot come. Jesus' time physically with the disciples was rapidly drawing to a close. Really, it was only hours left of his earthly life. There, of course, would be a brief time post-resurrection where there would be those many appearances of Jesus to his disciples, to the apostles, to the other followers. Uh, many He appeared to many, many people in those days before his ascension. But basically, this time physically with them was rapidly passing away. And as such, until their passing, with just the exclusion of those appearances before the ascension, the next time that they would see Jesus physically was with their own passing, when they would then be able to go to the heavenly places and await the fulfillment of all God's promises. We'll return to this little theme shortly. It does occur again. Um, and to Peter's response. But for now... Jesus continued, and we have this in verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know 
that you are my disciples if you love one another. First of all, I would just like to have a, a little note about this verse. You may have heard it said that this makes the 11th commandment. Well, I must disagree with that. It's not so. Jesus did not say an additional command I give you. He said a new command I give you. And we need to add to that, again, the teaching that we have dealt with a number of times, but please allow me just to briefly deal with it again. We need to add to that that the law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. Let's read in Luke chapter 16 and verse 16, where Jesus says, the law and the prophets were until John. Now you can read Hebrews, you can read Romans, that there was coming an end in those days to the Mosaic law. We need to add to this that Christian believers are not under that law of Moses, the Mosaic law. Let me just briefly read you some verses which prove that, although there are many, many more than just these few that I will read for you this morning. Romans chapter 6 verse 14. You are not under law, but under grace. First of all, you are not under law. Secondly, you are free from the law. In Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, Paul um, encourages them, exhorts them, Stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Free from what? Read the book of Galatians carefully. Free from the law of Moses. Romans chapter 7 verse 4. Romans chapter 7 verse 4. You have become dead to the law. If you're dead to it, it doesn't apply to you anymore. And then last of all, in Romans 10 verse 4, and we get this in numerous places, uh, it's also a major theme in the book of Hebrews, Christ is the end of the law. The law ended. The law drew to a close. The law is no longer of any effect as far as God is concerned. That's the Mosaic, the Jewish law. And so this command of Jesus it didn't fade away as the law of Moses did, neither was it an, ad an addition to the Ten Commandments, the so-called moral law. But it stands as Jesus' instruction to all Christians in all times. So love one another, a new command I give you. We need to em emphasize these things. So often there is misunderstanding and it leads people into such a muddle, and they end up confused and rather discouraged. Let's return to the verse itself. Love one another. As I have loved you, love one another. By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, this theme of love is one that really is emphasized quite considerably in our New Testaments. Let's just look at John chapter 15, verses 12 to 14. This is my command that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than, he, than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Very much, very much upon the same lines. Then, of course, there is the very, very well-known passage of 1 Corinthians 13. And who hasn't read that again and again and again and been deeply encouraged by it and the depths that it goes into? Let me just read it for us this time. 
Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, love does not seek its own, love does not provoke, and love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part but then I shall know just as I am known. And so now abides faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And then, of course, the great first epistle of John, 1 John, and you can find again and again and again, where he develops this theme of Christian love. Having said that, let's just go back to our verse and let's try and draw out in summary the main points of what Jesus is teaching. It's a new command to love one another. Just remember that the Mosaic commands were do these things. Now it's quite a different emphasis. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So the first thing we need to learn is we need to strive, and it is not easy. It's not a simplistic thing. It's not something that is easily done. We desperately need the empowering of the Holy Spirit to be able to love other people. Without that, our own self-centered human natures will soon run rampant and destroy any true love that we may have had for others, it is definitely the Holy Spirit that empowers us to do it. Secondly, with the same kind of love that Christ had for us. Now here is a deep thought that is a very sacrificial kind of love, even to the giving up of one's life. It is highly unlikely that we in our part of the world will be called upon to do that. But certainly there are parts of the world where that is a very real reality. I am reminded that in some parts of the world when young men and young women go to Bible college and they study to serve in the various churches and missions, one of the obligatory subjects is martyrdom because many of them will face martyrdom. And that's the reality in those countries. And they are taught and they are learning how to love as Christ loved. And the third thing we learn is that this kind of love, a Christian love one to another, brother and sister, Christian brother to Christian brother, Christian brother to Christian sister, and so on, is a testimony to the world. Uh, The world may, the men may know that you are my disciples. It is kind of a mark, uh, a, a, a brand name, if you say, that Christians love one another. Now we move on to verse 36. Jesus has been teaching. He's moved off the subject of where he's going, and he'll shortly leave them. And we find that Peter is just a little bit late to the party here. So suddenly he changes the subject back. Lord, where are you going? Excuse me? Subject changed. But anyway, 
He doesn't dismiss Peter quite like that. Jesus answers, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And so he's saying that where I am going is not a place that you physically can go later. But let me assure you, like the one thief on the cross, Jesus could assure them, you will be with me in paradise. Obviously meaning that after Peter had passed, after his death, he would then go to the same place that Jesus was going to. Well, as usual, Peter's mouth is at full speed before his brain is in gear. And so Peter then says, Lord, why can't I follow you now? Uh, big words of protest here. I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you really down, lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, of course, I think this is a very, very well-known passage. It occurs in the other Gospels, the denial of Jesus by Peter, his kind of bravado. Why can't I follow you now? He hasn't accepted that Jesus said, you can't follow me now. You will follow later. But Peter's taking a bit of a time to, to grasp this here now. And in this, isn't he so much like us? We, we, we find trouble grasping the things of Jesus, even though they're so clearly written in Scripture. We have to come back and back to them until finally we get the truth of what is being presented. That's pretty much all of us, pretty much all of us. But then it leads to this statement, I will lay down my life for you. Of course, we know this with, This is a well-known piece of, uh, of claim by, um, by Peter. And of course, it is revealed by the Lord to be faulty. And the Lord even reveals it with significant detail. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. These are the kind of details only one who has the control of history, only one who knows all that is going to happen in the coming future could possibly say things like that. So this, as I said, is just an introduction to the great chapters that follow. Jesus is announcing his departure is close. He won't be with them much longer. They can't come now. But in the meanwhile, love is the great command the great should be the great desire of all Christians and yet it is also one of the most difficult characteristics to find as Christian believers our flesh really fights against this kind of Christian love well that's pretty much what we've got in these verses from John chapter 13 and so Lord willing we shall move into the great chapter of chapter 14 next week and now we begin to uh, reveal some of the very precious truths that have encountered that Christians have encountered and they have been encouraged by for 2,000 years. So until next week my prayer for each of you is once again may the Lord richly bless and keep each one of you in the name of our precious Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <music>